Okay, welcome back after the break. Um, just before the, we went for our break, we were looking at uh, how the early disciples, the apostles, how they went about teaching, preaching the kingdom of God, and everything that they spoke and did was from a perspective or a framework uh, of the kingdom of God. Okay, um, so we saw that the early church thought about the kingdom. In our present time, you know, uh, the church is also to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The same good news that Jesus preached, you and I are also to preach, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Can somebody read Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, please? Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Can somebody read that quickly? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay. So we see that, um, you know, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Jesus says, which gospel will be preached? The kingdom of God. When we think about gospel, what do we always think of? John 3.16, yes, salvation. Right, but gospel is not just about John three sixteen. It's just not about salvation. It's also about the king. It's about his kingdom. It's about his principalities, his laws, his rules, uh, the nature of this king. It's of everything concerning the king, his kingdom, and the nature of the king and the kingdom. Okay, so uh, Jesus is saying the gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world. And what will happen? Then will the then the end will come. Okay. So for some reason, the church today we kind of lost this whole understanding, or prob uh, understanding about the kingdom of God, or probably we don't even have an understanding of the kingdom of God, or maybe it's very very little. Or as a church, we don't look at things from a kingdom of God perspective. Okay. But even as we go through this study, you know, we would learn things that Jesus taught concerning the kingdom of God. And I believe that will change our framework, our understanding, our perspective, our uh, thinking. So our thinking, our way of living will become an expression of the king's domain released in and through our life. When I say king's domain, I'm not just talking about authority, where we are just going around and binding the Satan on everybody, or, you know, we are just uh, hitting people and saying, releasing the work of Satan. It's not about going and being bosses. It's not about being uh, authoritative, commanding. No, we, it's, it's doing all of that, but in the sense of humility, authority with humility in the servant attitude that Jesus also modeled for um us okay so even as we are we are studying about the kingdom of god i believe and i pray and i hope that it'll change our thinking our way of living and our thinking and our way of living will be an, an expression of the king's domain that is being released in and through our life it'll be an expression of the fact that jesus christ is ruling in and through our life okay uh, before we end this uh, chapter Okay, uh, let's look at um, this parable um, in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. So can one of you please read Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 to 46. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a head around it, dug a wine press in it and built a tower. And he leased it to wine dressers and went into a far country. Now when winter's time drew near, he sent his servants to the wine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And this and the wine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. 
But when the wine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those wine dressers? They said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other wine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the, in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Amen. I like to concentrate on verse 43 where it says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Of course, we'll study this parable later on. Okay, but in the context of this chapter where we're talking about the church and the kingdom, I like to just focus on verse 43 where Jesus says, you know, um, the kingdom will be taken from you. Who is the you here? Okay. So the kingdom will be taken away from the nation of Israel or the Jews and given to whom? It will be given to another nation. Who is that? The Gentiles? Who is the other nation? <laughs> the Romans? The Gentiles will be given to another nation. He's talking about the church. Okay. So saying that because you, you were given the dominion, you were given the authority, you were given the power, okay, to rule and reign. And, you know, God gave them everything. He gave them the covenants, the law, the prophets, the forefathers. Every, the, everything was the nation of Israel. But they failed to bear fruit. And so God saying, because, son, I'm going to give it to a nation, and that is the church, the church and the kingdom, okay? So God offered to establish his kingdom here on earth through the nation of Israel, but they rejected it, and so the kingdom of God is now offered to another nation, and who is that? The church, and uh, the church comprises of whom? Us, believers, those who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Okay. And what is the what is uh, God looking for the church to do? He looked for the nation of Israel to bear fruit. And now since they did not bear fruit, he's given that authority to the church. And what is the church now looked upon to bear? Fruit. Okay. So you and I have to bear fruit, right? Tell yourself that in your mind, I have to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Yes, we have to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And God is looking for fruits. Sometimes we think God is a very nice God. He's very loving. He understands. You know, he's gracious, he's merciful. But at the same time, even though he's gracious and merciful, he is a businessman. We, you know, we will study. We will study about that. You know, he is this king. He is this businessman who is looking for fruits. He's looking at us as doubling what he has given us. Parable of the talents, right? He's looking for us to double, to multiply. Not to just take it and keep it in the ground and say hallelujah and sit on it, you know. But he's looking for us to double and to multiply and to bear fruit. Okay, so as believers, we're here to bear fruit, which is the outworking of the kingdom of God in and through our lives. When can we bear fruit? When we remain in Jesus, when we abide in the vine, only then can you bear fruit. Because Jesus says very clearly, John chapter 
14 says John 14 or 16 15 or 16 he says with the apart from you apart from me you can bear no fruit okay apart from me you can bear no or you can John chapter 15 apart from me you can bear no fruit okay so the secret is to abide in the wine okay and um, so we see that God desires his rule and reign to be expressed through us in and through an, the earth and how important the kingdom of God is for the king. For the king, his kingdom is so important. But is it important for you and me? Is the question that we ask. Do we ever work with this mindset that, hey, I belong to the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I'm preaching about the king. I'm a co-head of the king. I'm a son and daughter of the king. I have to live with the kingdom principles, kingdom authority, kingdom thinking, kingdom mentality. No, we hardly do that. But I hope this study is going to get us to that place where we are going to be kingdom-minded, kingdom thinkers, kingdom planners, kingdom action movers. Okay? So what should be our attitude towards the kingdom of God? What should be your attitude and my attitude towards the kingdom of God? Just another parable, which is not here given in your notes. But Matthew chapter 13, you know, Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 and 45. Can somebody read that, please? Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 and 45. Please read. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like tre is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearl. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nina John, for telling us this is John chapter 15. Uh, John chapter 15 is about... Um, uh, the yeah, abiding in the wine. So here it's talk. Here Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, and what is he saying here in John chapter thirteen, Matthew chapter thirteen, verses forty four and forty five? What is he saying? Yes, he's talking about the kingdom of God as priceless. Okay, and he's saying it's like a treasure that is hidden in a field. And when a man found the treasure, what did he do? He went and he, he, he did again and went and bought that field. Actually, he sold everything that he had just to buy that field or that land. Why? Because he knew that treasure in that land was worth more than all that he had. Okay. And again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. Okay, and he, as he goes traveling, he's looking for that exquisite, you know, really good, beautiful, um, that uh, jewels, those pearls that really stand out from the rest. Okay, and when he found one pearl of great, one pearl of great value, what does he do? He sells everything and he buys it. So what is Jesus actually trying to tell us here? Value of uh, kingdom of heaven price. So Jesus is saying, hey, know the value or the price or the importance of the kingdom of God. Okay. So Jesus is basically saying here, hey, look, if you want to have the kingdom, if you want to experience the kingdom, then you have to be like this man who dug this field, found the treasure, but he did, went and sold everything that he got and took the treasure or this merchant who went looking for fine pearls he found one and he sold everything to buy that so he's saying you know what is jesus really saying yes that the kingdom of god is priceless yes thank you nina john jackin says we can boldly lose anything to inherit and experience the kingdom of god yes anything in this world which we consider valuable precious the best you know, and we don't want to give up. Everything is actually worthless and nothing compared to pursuing the kingdom of God. Whether it be relationships, 
whether it be money, whether it be our job, our careers, our houses, our families, nothing is worth or you know as precious as the kingdom of God. It does not mean that because of the kingdom of God we overlook all of these things. No, that's not what we are saying. We are saying how precious God's kingdom is. So, you know, Jesus is basically saying, "Hey, if you want this kingdom, then this is your this should be your attitude." You got to come after it. You have to give it everything that you have and just go after this kingdom. So the question that and a challenge I like to leave with us is, you know, are we ready to do that? Are we ready to give up everything of this world, uh, you know, just to go after that kingdom, to pursue God's kingdom? It doesn't mean that, you know, uh, we're going to give up everything and God is saying, you, you know, you have to give up everything then only the son. No, when, uh, what does uh, 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 Matthew chapter 6, you know, say, uh, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Okay. So God is not a debtor, you know, of man. He's not saying you seek his kingdom and leave everything and you're not going to get anything in bargain in, in the return. But he's saying you seek my kingdom first, but everything else that you want, that you need, you know, your desires of your heart will be met. What a loving God that we have. Okay. So, yeah, also that we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Yes. Thank you, Nina. Okay. Uh, so this is the attitude that we have. And as people or saints who are you know, part of the kingdom of God, part of the church who has been given the authority, the keys of the kingdom. We need to be kingdom minded, kingdom thinking, king, king, thinking with a kingdom perspective. Okay. Any questions on this chapter? Take the mic and ask quickly. I can just see it at the tip of your uh, lips. The church and the kingdom. Mike, 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 please. It's like from uh, Matthew chapter 13, like uh, from the parable, like keep it close. Yeah, he already like uh, the one who went. Mm. Mm. He already uh, like found the treasure, right? Yes. Why have to hid it and then go sell it? He can directly take the treasure and go. Yeah, good question. So his question is, you know, he found a treasure, he can just take it and go. Does he have the right to take that treasure? <laughs> it's the, is it his field? If he goes and sells it, they'll ask him where you got it from. He has no right, right? It does not belong to him. But if he found that bought that field, he can say, I dug, I bought this field, I dug the ground, I found this treasure. This treasure belongs to me. Right? Yeah. Like I recently read in one of the mountains, I, uh, you know, a guy was climbing one of these mountain, he's a mountaineer, he goes climbing. And I think it's Everest or somewhere, I don't know which mountain, but there was, um, uh, when, he, when he was climbing up, he found precious, beautiful uh, uh, stones, sapphires and rubies, very, very precious, very beautiful, very expensive. And then uh, he he knew that he can't keep it. It belongs to the government. So, you know, it's not in our country, but in another country. So he goes and, you know, gives it to the government. And uh, they realized that one of these um, planes, it was an Indian Airlines plane, you know, in those days, you know, it crashed on that mountain. And there was a, a, a jeweler who was traveling and he would have carried these jewels. And uh, that government was so uh, good, they gave the, this man some precious stones from the you know from the thing that he what he found yes so he he did what was right it was not his he went and gave it to the government but yes he got a gift in return that's nice so that is why this man goes and hides it again and then he goes and sells everything buys his field and say hey this is my treasure okay so the, what is jesus saying the kingdom of god is like this you look at it there's so much of treasure but what you need to do is you can't possess it, you can't have it till you are willing to give up everything, your sin, your old life, and come and be part of it. That is what he's saying. Yes. 
you can't uh, be on you know on the fence either this side or that side yeah any questions anyone has regarding this chapter chapter 3 okay there are no questions can we move on to chapter 4 please any on the online students have any questions chapter 3 No? Okay, we'll move on to chapter four. Now, uh, even as we study chapter four, um, thank you, Jackin, uh, we learn to look at, um, king, you know, we will learn to look at kingdom thinking and we learn how to think completely from a new perspective, completely from a new frame of mind that is kingdom thinking and from kingdom perspective. Okay, because the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is not like the earthly kingdom. The people of this world think in a particular way, in a particular perspective, a particular frame of mind. But as kingdom of God citizens, kingdom of heaven citizens, we need to change. Why do I say we need to change our thinking, change our thinking perspective, the framework from which we think? Why do, we, why do you think I say that? Won't think that we are the cohes of God. Okay. So we should think that we are cohes of God and we belong to the kingdom. To okay. Him. Why do I say we need to change our thinking? Okay. One of the, one of uh, the answers is that yes. The word of God will be renewed. Okay. The word of God says. Renew yes, to renew be renewed by the transforming yes. of your mind. Why should we renew our mind? So that we can we can, uh, we can build the kingdom. We can uh, know the what is good and uh, perfect okay. will of God is. We to do here to build the kingdom of God. Okay, we studied the renewing of the mind in the last semester, right? The first semester I taught you. So it's. We need to renew our mind from our old pattern of thinking, our old sinful pattern. When we are born again, our spirit man is born again, but not our, our soul. Soul is our mind, will, and our emotions. Okay. So Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Can somebody please read? Um, online students, can one of you please read Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, please? Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Yes. Amen. Thank you. So here this verse says that God has already qualified us. Before you even gave the test, even before you wrote the exam, you've already passed the test. You passed the exam. Why? Because God has already qualified us. He has qualified us for what? Yes, to enjoy the inheritance that he has for his people. Okay? So you and I are already qualified to partake of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Okay. Look at verse 13. It says, who has delivered us uh, from the powers of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his own dear son. Okay. Um, so you and I are in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and he has brought us out of the kingdom of darkness. Um, so the kingdom of Jesus is a kingdom of light and the kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of darkness. So we are brought out of darkness and we are brought into the kingdom of light that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You know, we know that darkness and light are totally opposite, contrast, yes. So also the kingdom of Jesus and the kingdom of this world or the kingdom that we are used to living in are totally 
opposite total contrast, they're total different kingdoms. Okay. And you and I now belong to which kingdom? Yes, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Okay. And the kingdom of God is where? In us, within us, it's inside us. What does Jesus say in um yeah, Nina John says we need to get rid of the worldly perspective, and that is why we need to renew our mind. Yes, thank you, Nina. Okay, uh, look at what Jesus said in John chapter 18, verse 36. Can somebody please read John chapter 18, verse 36? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Jews but now my kingdom is not from here. Yes, Jesus says, you know, my kingdom is not of this world, which means he's saying the kingdom that we all belong to is not of this world. We are of God. And, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, we are not of this world. Uh, we do not belong to this world. Uh, we belong to the kingdom of God. And therefore, in, uh, you know, in the way that we live, the perspectives of our lifestyle, our values, our thinking, you know, everything that we do should be very different from the things of this world, because we don't belong to the kingdom of this world, but we belong to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Uh, look at what uh, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. 1 John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because he who is in you, in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, he who know God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Amen. Thank you. So he's uh, Jesus, uh, uh, you know, John wrote, sorry, John wrote and says, they are of the world and because they are of the world, they speak as of the world. So the people of the world speak like the people of the world. And when they speak, what happens? The people of the world hear them right but you know that is why when you are preaching or teaching the gospel to somebody you're saying how many times i have spoken and shared the gospel but this person doesn't seem to relate doesn't seem to understand doesn't seem to change it's not coming to make a decision why because 1 John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 very clearly says, they are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. So they want to hear worldly things. They want to hear where they get prosperity, blessings, sins are forgiven, you know, moksha, this, that, everything they want. But, you know, salvation is also not just, is not just, a ritual it's a lifestyle it is living okay so here jesus says that you know the people of the world speak as of the world so you and i who are of the kingdom of god we need to how do we need to speak we need to speak as people of the kingdom of god okay so even in our speaking there should be a difference okay and therefore, we need to change or adapt to a new way of speaking. Okay. So as people of this world, how was our speaking? Uh, what's the difference? I know it's different, but as people of the world, how is our speaking? People of the world? How do the people of the world speak? Yes, if you love them, they will speak to you with love and compassion. But if you don't, yes, there's always complaining, grumbling, murmuring. You know, there's no, there's hopelessness. Huh? Backstabbing, jealousy. They speak with so much of hopelessness, no encouragement, no hope whatsoever. 
ever. So he's saying, you know, we as kingdom citizens, we need to adapt and speak in a new way. The same, similarly, just like we adapt and speak like kingdom citizens, we also need to adapt to a new way of thinking. Okay, there should be a new paradigm shift. There should be a new framework of mind. And we call this what? Kingdom thinking. Okay, we need to think in a kingdom concept, kingdom theory, kingdom model, kingdom idea. Okay, so we call this Jesus, uh, uh, kingdom thinking. And Jesus in his teaching, uh, in all the parables, he also spoke about kingdom thinking. Okay, and he shared with us this new paradigm, this new concept, this new model, this new uh, way of kingdom thinking. And, um, you know, the more we think as people of the kingdom of light, the more we will behave like the people of the kingdom of light. And the more we will be able to manifest the kingdom of God here on earth. So everything comes with our thinking. Our thoughts become our actions. Our actions become our Habits, our habits become our character, it becomes who we are, okay? Uh, John, in chapter 18, you know, uh, when he was uh, interviewed, John chapter 18, you can turn to John chapter 18. When he was interviewed by Pilate, you know, um, And uh, Pilate says, you know, um, are you the king of the Jews? What does Jesus say? It is as you, it is as you have said. Okay. And um, Jesus continued in that same conversation in John chapter 18, verse 36. Look at what Jesus says in verse 36. Can somebody read verse 36, please? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Yeah, Jesus is saying, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. Meaning my kingdom, he's saying, comes from above. It's totally a different kingdom. It does not belong to this kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. Uh, and it also means that now you and I are belonging to this kingdom, which is not of this world. So we are totally from a different world, you know, uh, from the totally from a different world that we grew up in, which we were nurtured, which we were born in. So we are not of this world. Okay. We are in a kingdom that is not of this world now just for the sake of example okay i'm just giving you an example okay now you know um some of you drive and ride around the city of bangalore and you know in the city of bangalore or anywhere in india we don't have lane discipline all of us are in and out out and in everywhere we find place whether it's in the footpath anywhere we squeeze and go in and out thank god we're not above cars and lorries and buses and we're not going below cars lorries and uh, buses apart from that we're all over the place okay we don't have lane discipline and we also don't have discipline of ob observing traffic lights even orange, you know, it's coming to red, we are just speeding. Even if sometimes if it is red, we can see people still going, okay? No sense of traffic uh, rules for us, okay? Following the traffic signal. Also, when it comes to, um, you know, um, parking, we park anywhere and everywhere. And people sometimes get so annoyed, you know. This morning also we were, I was coming on a very uh, busy traffic road and just at the junction where traffic has to turn into that road, there is one cab guy just happily sitting in the car just there at the junction and, you know, speaking on the mobile and all of them are getting so angry and pointing a hand like this to him and saying, have some sense, you know. So anywhere and everywhere we park, but we see the policemen then we don't park in that place. But parking signal is there, not there. We just park anywhere and everywhere. Even uh, for us, all of India is a garbage dump. We can just throw anything, whatever we want, anywhere. Now, just imagine, you know, you take the flight and go to New York. You land in New York. 
you get out the airport just think that you know you already have a driver's license where you can drive around the world you hire a car and then automatically what do you do you all follow the lane discipline you follow the traffic signs and uh, in the us even if you want you come to a junction where there is uh, four roads you have to wait so if the person on opposite you is going then you have the right to go and then the other person who is standing on your right hand side he has the right to go the person who has a left hand side has to go so there's no traffic signal but they are so well coordinated even if it is a very isolated place they will just follow this discipline they will wait hey, you're first you have to go i'm second i have to go i'm third i have to go i'm fourth i have to go just so neat you know and then uh, you are drinking coffee and uh, you know you know that you can't just throw your cup outside or your tissue paper after wiping your hand outside the window you keep it in your car or your vehicle and when you get back home you throw it in the dump it in the trash can right you follow parking rules so two days you're living in new york you come back you you know come back to bangalore city you take your car and then you're driving immediately no hebal flyover no lane discipline you're going in and out you're drinking your coffee you just throw the cup you're wiping your hand throw the tissue paper you know you just park anywhere get into a shop just two minutes i want to get something you know you're not bothered where you are parking you know so your whole thinking changes okay maybe i'm just i don't know if i'm exaggerating but i think this is the truth that this happens in our city i've seen that okay uh now what is the point i'm trying to make two things our perspectives are different our cultures are different right you know and you we all think according to our culture our culture affects our behavior you know um i remember when we had gone to the us we were in a very isolated place and my sister had drunk cold coffee and she just it was a forest area and she wanted to throw <laughs> throw her coffee mug into the it was like a you know valley she just wanted to throw it down and immediately my brother in law who is a uh, american he says no no don't do that keep it in the car we we'll go back home and throw it you know just be really embarrassed but you know just thinking hey anyway is going down in the valley nobody is going to see it you know but he was like no no can't do that you know and i was just thinking man this is a forest area that's a valley but look at the sense of you know the cultural identity how they are brought up that you can't even just throw it even if it's a valley right so that is the culture that is their upbringing but for us valley no valley anywhere we can just um, throw it so a perspective changes according to the culture okay um and the second thing i want to say is sometimes we think that we can't change our thinking right you can say i can't change my thinking this is how i was brought up but you were brought up like that in india but when you go to new york or you go to any country abroad you change your thinking you follow it yes or no don't you do don't you do that yes so eventually we also change our behavior so we can't say hey i can't change my thinking we can't give excuses okay so the first thing is all about culture you think the way that you are the culture that you are brought in your culture affects your behavior and second one is that hey we all have the potential to change nobody can say i cannot change you can you can change your way of thinking just imagine you board on the plane you just get down immediately your thinking changes okay um so you know um you adapt you Im immediately change your behavior so likewise coming down back to our thinking with with relation to the kingdom culture now we are in the kingdom of god culture the kingdom of god is very different from the kingdom of the world the mindsets the way we think the patterns of our thinking the framework of our thinking our thoughts our perceptions everything in the kingdom of god is very different from the kingdom of the world okay so although you are in the world 
You're called to live by what culture? Yeah, the kingdom of God. You're called to think like what? The kingdom of God. And can we say, hey, I can't do it? No, we can't have any excuse, okay? The fact is that we can do it, okay? The reality is that we are in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is in us. So the culture is in us, okay? But unfortunately, many of us have not transitioned into kingdom thinking, kingdom mindset, kingdom perspective, kingdom frame of mind, but hopefully, you know, after this morning's class and as we continue next week, uh, we will be challenged enough to say, hey, now I belong to the kingdom of God. I need to start thinking with kingdom perspective, kingdom mindset, you know, make that kingdom paradigm uh, shift. And I need to look at things the way Jesus wants me to look at things. Okay. Now, um, I think Romans chapter 6, you know, Paul says that we identify ourselves spiritually with Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and him being seated at the right hand of God. So how do we uh, relate to him spiritually being seated at the right hand of God? Yes, it basically means that, you know, um, sorry, when what does it mean when we uh, spiritually are, you know, ascended to the Father? It means we basically think from a kingdom perspective. We've gone higher, we've gone to a higher plane, we've gone to a, where Jesus is ascended back to the Father. What does it mean spiritually for us? It means that we begin to look at things the way God wants us to look at. We look at things in a heavenly perspective. And is it possible? Yes, it is possible. We can do it. Um, and if you're able to think from kingdom perspective, what happens? Our lives will be changed. Yes, the way we live, our lifestyles, our behavior will be changed. And then truly we'll be able to demonstrate the kingdom of God in this world. Okay. Um, and all of it has to begin with what? With our thinking, kingdom thinking. Now let's look at how Jesus thought about kingdom thinking or what he thought about kingdom thinking. Jesus says, you know, he, he teaches, he gives various illustrations, parables, and this is how you need to be thinking as people of the kingdom of God. Okay. So even as we look at Jesus' teaching, I really want to encourage all of you, you know, and all of us to develop a kingdom mindset, a kingdom framework from which we will look at things, from which we will perceive things, from which we will understand things, and how we will make our choices and our uh, decisions. And if we truly do that, you know, we will truly be a kingdom community and we will have a kingdom culture among us. So let's look at what Jesus thought about kingdom thinking. You know, um, the first thing Jesus said is, you know, look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 30. Matthew chapter 21, chapter 5, verses 21 to 30. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember you that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your, father, to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that, uh, that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery, but with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. 
Amen. You know, Jesus is teaching here is very, very radical, right? Um, something that is very extreme. He's saying that, you know, um, you know, if you murder somebody, that is, what is that? If you murder somebody, it is sin. Yes. And you know that you're going to get a serious punishment. A serious judgment is there. But Jesus is saying, hey, I'm telling you that in this kingdom that I'm coming from, that I'm assuring, that I'm bringing into, it's not just murder that is sin, but even hatred in your heart is sin. Hatred in your heart towards your brother or your sister or anyone is like murder. You might not have committed the act, but it's as equal as murder. And then he goes on to say, if you commit adultery, it's a sin, okay? But he says, if you commit adultery, you know that it is sin. But he says, hey, the kingdom that I come from, you know, that I am initiating here on the earth, you know, in that kingdom, he's saying, even if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery in your heart, you've already possessed her in your heart, and that is sin. Okay, and then he says, he goes on to say, so you need to deal with it. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, what you should do? Pluck it out. Radical, extreme. If your right hand causes you to sin, what should you do? Cut it off. So what is Jesus meaning to say here? Yes, please take the mic. Thank you. Hmm. Anything that's a hindrance to between you going towards the kingdom or you staying in the kingdom of God, you immediately take it out of your life so that there doesn't interrupt that relation between you and God. Yes. It says deal. Yes, Nina John says, uh, you know, very well said, deal drastically with sin. You know, drastically you need to deal with sin. That means be very severe with yourself in the way you deal with sin. Even if it has to cutting off a part of your body or pulling out of your eye, deal with sin very, very drastically. Which means what? Don't be playful and easy and light and, you know, enjoy sin and say, okay, I can get over it. Don't play with huh? Don't flirt. <laughs> yes, don't flirt with sin. Don't play with sin. Don't enjoy sin. So he's saying, hey, when it comes, Jesus is saying, when it comes to sin, there should be zero tolerance. You can't even tolerate it. Okay. Even if it means going through a process of pain, you know, you have to go through it. And that is kingdom thinking. Okay. Usually we tend to come, you know, um, uh, to live according uh, to the standards that are that are around us like we we tend to do what the world does you know we think like the world does we behave like the world does and jesus is saying don't go down to that level don't go down to that standard because my standard or my level my kingdom is greater than the standard of this world okay than the way of this world and that is what renewed mind is what is renewed mind And Jesus says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So when you, anyone asks you what is a renewed mind, tell them, Jesus said, you know, my thoughts are not my, your thoughts. Your My ways are not your ways. So a renewed mind is taking on the higher thoughts and the higher ways of God. So sometimes, you know, we justify many things. We say, hey, he or she is doing it, so why not I? We can look at people in the workplace. We look at people in, uh, you know, around us in our in our church, in our in our uh, families, in our um, the world around, and say, "Hey, they are doing it. Then you know, why not I also do it? You know, there's nothing wrong. There's no mistake. Then they do can do it. You no, know, why can't I do it? Maybe they are doing it because they are people of the world, but we don't belong to this world. We're not of this world, and we don't do it the way of this world." I mean, they, uh, Billy Graham used to say one thing that, what does my Bible say? It? If my Bible says, I will do it. That's one thing that you always used to follow. Thank yes. You. Thank you, Sean. So if your Bible says, then you do it. So this is the way it is in the kingdom of God. You belong to a kingdom where murder is not just sin, but also hatred is equally sin and equally sinful as 
murder. Okay, we'll stop here. And um, I want you to, you know, even as we learn about the king, to worship the king and pray. Remember that prayer we looked at in John, Psalm chapter 44, verse 4, you know. And also, even as we uh, have looked at kingdom thinking, you know, uh, think in kingdom perspective, kingdom mindset, and everything that you do, let your thinking be according to the kingdom. Okay. Um, Rinchani says that laying the axe to the root of sin. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any questions anyone has? If there are no questions, we'll end class. Regarding to culture, I didn't understand that example exactly about what you meant. Okay, yeah. um, Next class. Sorry, we'll, okay. I'll explain it to you personally. I think everyone else understood that okay. uh, example. I'll, uh, Sean, I'll explain it to you. No problem. Okay. I have a class next hour, then I'll explain. Okay, okay. okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Have a blessed week and I'll see you next week. Thank you.